so that when we appeal, when Peter says, or when that uh, that, that Jesus that dictum, says, he says, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. You're talking about a man without spirit apart from prayer. Mm. Yo, my peoples. Hello what and pe- welcome back to <laughs> I was gonna say, what peoples are your peoples? Everybody's my peoples because all are sons and daughters of God. And for those who aren't, they are. They just don't know it. Yes. So my peoples, welcome back to the move where we are vibing with the book 10 minutes at a time. Today we're looking at Romans chapter 7 verses 13 to 20. And the question is, have you read it? This is one that you're going to want to read because honestly, we're going to get into some deep things. It's going to be confusing at the beginning, but we believe by the end of it, there will be clarity. So go read it. And while you do that on the way there or back, go ahead and subscribe, like, share a comment. Let us know how you're doing. And uh, we'd love to hear from you. Yeah. All right. With that said, 10 minutes are on the clock. Three, two, one. Let's go. All right, so Romans 7, verse 13. He's already on this. We've already talked about this a little bit, but just to backtrack, Romans 5, we have peace with God. Also, these two realities between Adam 1 and Adam 2. Then he, in Romans 6, says we are dead to sin and alive to God. That means we are free from sin. We've discussed what that means. We're now slaves to righteousness. And we're released from the condemnation The bondage. The bondage and even relationship to the law. So if you ask me, hey, what's your relationship to the law? The answer is that you're dead. You're dead to the law, right? Dead. So what has happened often concerning Romans 7 is that the appeal is often made that now that I'm in Christ, well, you know, I have this struggle in the flesh. Yeah, I'm curious about that. Have you ever had that? Because... Paul here is describing an experience I think every single one of us knows fairly intimately. Yes. This, this, I, I got this thing that I want to do. I have yes. these goals. I have this standard upon which I want to live. And, and this isn't just like a Christian experience. Even We've been talking around this idea that even those who don't profess faith in any kind of deity yes. know that there's a standard of living, that there's a certain way that they ought to live yes. and yet can't quite hit the mark. Yes. And so that that struggle between knowing what they ought to do and what they really do is the realization of all too often falling short. Yeah. So that you would say things like, man, the things I want to do. Don't do. I don't do. And the things I don't want to do are the things I really do. And then you get phrases in common parlance where like, well, you know, man, we just human. Yep. Everybody makes mistakes. Yep. We all fall short sometimes, and maybe you sing a gospel song about it. We fall down, <laughs> will we get up? Right? Yeah. I had that experience this morning. Uh, I was telling you about this. I was like, man, because Emily and I are on this kick where we're trying to get up early in the morning and do some good things for our body, like like working out and eating healthy and spending time in the scriptures together as a family. That didn't happen this morning. The thing that I wanted to do, I didn't do. Right. And that everybody knows what we're talking about. They're called New Year's resolutions. <laughs> it is. I mean, it's what is January? What is almost 15 or so? No, nah, like January 10. Where nah. are you? Couldn't even make it two weeks, dude. Right. Yeah, it's January 10th. Man. So um, so what happens? New Year's resolutions. We ought to be doing these things, but then we fall short so that then. We baptize that idea and say that this is what exactly is going on in our Christian life. And we use Paul in Romans 7 to justify that in the Christian life. And then we use common phrases like I said, ah, we're human. And then the other popular one is an appeal to Peter when he's falling asleep, when Jesus invites him to pray. The flesh is... The spirit, the spirit is, is willing, sorry. Willing. The flesh is weak. The I flesh got it out of order. Is weak, right? But if you go back to that text, this is what's very interesting. If you go back to that text, what Peter are you talking about? Yeah. You're talking about a Peter who was unconverted. Mm-hmm. And Jesus also, literally said as much, Peter, yes. I'm praying for you that when you are converted uh, in the future. Yeah. And you're also talking to a man who has been invited to by Jesus into prayer to be sustained against the trial that is actually coming up. But Peter falls short of entering in that invitation and instead falls asleep. Mm -hmm. So the spirit is willing and the spirit is willing to do what? To sustain you 
at the point of temptation if you're willing to commune with spirit. So it's not that there's this thing inside of Peter called his flesh and this other thing inside of Peter called the spirit yeah. and they're at war with each other. Is that what you're saying? Yes. That, but instead it's that Peter himself is weak, but there's this other thing outside of yes. Peter known as the spirit. Yes. And the spirit is willing to sustain Peter, but yes. Peter hasn't quite yet accepted the spirit into his life, thus entering into strength. Yes. So that when we appeal, when Peter says, or when that, 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 Jesus that dictum, says. he says, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. You're talking about a man without spirit apart from prayer. Mm. Right? Yeah, man, that's that's an experience that I think uh, many of us know about. So, and I, I I can hear the pushback. Yeah. Right. Well, Jonathan, this is my experience, and I've been a Christian for X number of years. What are you saying that Christians don't struggle? Hmm. Well, it depends what sort of struggle you're talking about. Yeah. Because if you're talking about the struggle of feeling a desire in your flesh that wants to do that which you claim you've been liberated from, that struggle, ladies and gentlemen, is real. Yeah. That is a real struggle. But here's where... Here's what I had a friend say. The struggle is real, but the victory is just as real. Exactly. The victory is just as real. The and here's how, here's how we know it. I mean, it's said so many times. We've, we've done several videos mm -hmm. around this idea mm -hmm. that you are no longer a slave to sin. Sin doesn't have to have dominion under o o over you mm -hmm. at all. So, so yes, the struggle is real, but there has to be victory. And when is the victory? What is the victory? Even our faith. Yeah. So it's the belief. So let's break this down real quick while we have like four minutes. Go for it. So verse, t verse 13, did that which is good then bring death to me by no means? It was sin producing death in me through what is good in order that sin might be showed to be sin through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. So what happens that sin arises within me when the commandment is highlighted? We've already discussed that in the previous 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. Go back. Check that out. Look at what verse 14 says. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh sold under sin. So right there, he's framing a man who still has a relationship to the law. But in light of the law, he is making a conclusion about his present reality. And what is that? That he is still of the flesh. Sold under sin. So, so what we're saying here is that when Paul uses this language of I am Etc. cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yep. Therefore, I do this even yep. though I want to do this or yep. I don't do this because I want to do this, et cetera, et cetera, yep. et cetera. That man that is being defined as yep. this metaphorical man is someone who by definition is still of under the flesh. Under the flesh. He's still of the flesh. And yet earlier he said very clearly that yes. that's no longer who he that's is. That's no longer who he is. So right? when Paul says these things in Romans, he's actually not talking about a present day reality, but a reality mm -hmm. that he had in the past when he was still under the condemnation of the law, when he was still a slave to the law. Exactly. And the reason he's doing this is in verse 7. What shall we say then? That the law is sin? He's actually trying to explain the relationship of the law to somebody who's sold under sin. And he's already concluded way earlier in the text that everybody sold under sin. Mm -hmm. So he's appealing to those who know the law to make sense of the role of the law in the life of somebody who's sold under sin, which are both Jew and Gentile. And that is very clear from verse one. Or do you not know, brothers, for I'm speaking to those who know the law. Mm -hmm. You see? Mm -hmm. So this is what's at play. So when he goes to verse 16, now, if I do what I do not want to do, I agree with the law that it is good. Uh, oh, sorry. Let's go first 15 because that's the famous one. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not know what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So sin again is rising up in relationship to the law to manifest its evil desires. And I love the way that this language points out the relationship that you and I have towards sin, that it's actually this separate thing from you, that when you are experiencing a moment of struggle, because even if you are reborn, even yeah. if you have the spirit in your life, it doesn't mean that you're free from struggle. The Bible yeah. is clear on that. Yeah. But when you have struggle, that is not actually you doing it That's because right. you are made new, you are resurrected in Christ. So when this thing comes up and then you've experienced the struggle, Paul's pointing the picture as that's not you, exactly. that's sin, sin inside of you. Now, here's, here's a, a crucial point to understand is that your ability to Ooh, sin come on. does not define you as sin. One more go. Your ability to sin 
does not define you as or determine you as sin. Mm -hmm. And so this is something, again, shout out to Dan Moeller, who has just been instrumental. But you cannot, you cannot run the risk of identifying your ability to sin with an identity as sin. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have to do a part two, because this is where the victory is won. That even when you participate in a pattern of your former ignorance, because that is to be sure that sometimes we go there. Yeah. yeah. We do fall down sometimes. Absolutely. Right? But you need to know that you're not a sinner who falls down. Mm-hmm. You need to know that you are first and foremost daughter, son, child of God who has now been redeemed, restored, and is somebody who is believing on Jesus Christ even when you fall down so that the victory you have is the renewing of mind that you are for certain that your new creation and not the old thing that used to be sold under sin. So all this to say that even if you were to fall and perhaps even when you fall, your falling is not the same kind of falling as it was in the past. It's a different kind of falling. And I think in the next episode, we'll dive into what that looks like. Yes. So thanks for joining us on the move for the last 10 minutes. And uh, stay tuned for uh, part two of this discussion of Romans 7. See you tomorrow.